Hello, Rise Up Kings family. I'm so excited about our next guest, Jim Morris. He's the personification of following your dreams. He achieved his dream of being a major league pitcher at the age of 35 years old. It was actually turned into a movie, The Rookie. He is a motivational speaker and a powerful man of faith. Uh, welcome, Jim, to the show. Thank you, sir. Yeah, glad to have you. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit earlier, but I had actually seen you speak at uh, at one of our entrepreneur organizations events, and uh, just grateful to even have you on this podcast. And so, uh, I'd like to. I'd love to start out. I'd love to start out. What um, when I mean, you have a pretty powerful story? Um, why don't you share with the audience uh, just uh, some key pieces of that? Um, so they know a little bit about your background and and kind of kind of what you've gone through. Ooh, background. Um, sports have been my life. In between the white lines, I could be the kid I was supposed to be. Uh, the movie doesn't depict it, but the relationship with my father and myself was absolutely horrendous, physically and verbally abusive. He's holding my little brother one time. He looks down at me. He goes, "This is the one we wanted. We never wanted you." Mm. And you know. Bruises go away, the words, they stick with you. And you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, why do you even try? You're embarrassing us. Uh, whatever it was, he threw his whole arsenal at me and he goes, when are you gonna become a man? And would have me do these menial tasks. He brought this big heavy rod home one day and had me break up a whole patio with concrete. And he just, I have blisters, I'm bleeding. And he goes, I'm gonna make a man out of you sometime. I'm like, I'm 13, <laughs> you know, and never could live up to what, whatever it was that he perceived I should be. And I'm glad I didn't because I turned out like I have. And, you know, the one thing I've learned through life is I didn't repeat the mistakes that he did when I raised kids. And so I knew how not to parent. And during that process, he and my mother did the biggest favor for me. They never knew they did. They moved me from Miami, Florida, where they lived, to Brownwood, Texas, with my grandparents. And it was my grandparents that taught me about faith, and they taught me about humility, and they taught me about giving back. And because of those two people, I am who I am. And at 15, I could have gone off the rails real easily, but not on my grandparents' watch. And with everything I had to do with my parents, including watching my little brother getting chores done, cooking dinners at 10, I go to my grandparents' house and I had two rules. If you do it, own it. Own it, live up to it, and move on. Number two, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said because the truth is a truth that doesn't change. And those were the rules for me. Mm. And I went from a place where I could never do good enough to wanting to please my grandparents. And so I did everything I could to become that ideal. I wanted to be like my grandparents because I watched them make Thanksgiving dinners for families that couldn't afford it, buy Christmas presents for families with kids that couldn't afford it, out of their own account, pay a bill for somebody so they could keep their dream going on a little bit longer. And my grandfather, he fought in World War II. He came home with a young family, started a menswear store in Brownwood, Texas, population 20,000 people. And when I moved back, I worked for him in the summers. And he would look at me and teach me lessons every day. And one day he looked at me, he goes, I'm not selling clothes, Jimmy, I'm selling me. If I can sell me, they will come back. And people came back constantly. I did a speech probably 10 years ago now, but it was a, a fundraiser for a children's home. It was in Houston. And I, I talk about my grandparents quite a bit during my speeches. And after the speech, this man comes up to me, he's about 95. And when you have kids, something happens to men. It's like, you can't cry before you have kids. But once you have kids, it's like, you start having these emotions and water falls out of your eyes. And this guy's crying before he gets to me. And so I start crying and he walks up and he goes, I know your grandfather. And he opens his jacket and had Ernest Morris menswear on it, on the lapel. Wow. And that jacket had to be 40 years old because it'd been that long since the store had closed. And he goes, I went into the store one day and told Ernest what I wanted to do with my life. And he said, I don't think that's what you're suited for. He said, at first I hurt my feelings. 
But then he gave me three or four more other options in which he thought I would be better suited for. He goes, I wanted to tell you that. Last month at 95, I sold the last of my nine banks. He talked me into going into banking. And because of him, I've had an incredible career and my family has done incredibly well. And I thought, wow, you know, it's not just this memory in the past of my grandparents were awesome people. There are other people saying it. Yeah. And so I know that my memories are true because I watched my grandfather, my grandmother work with countless people and everybody loved them. It's the, it's so the ripple effect, right? It's the leaving a legacy and the impact. And, and you talk, you talk regularly about, about, uh, and, and I think, I think you talk regularly about reaching your dreams and going after your dreams, which does cause a ripple effect, right? Which yes. does cause that ripple effect. So I was curious, where do you think you got that? So you're obviously you're, you're, uh, you're, you're a top motivational speaker. You're, uh, you're a professional athlete in the MLB. You were a, um, you've done a lot of things. Where do you think you got this? Like, was it built into you, this, this desire to go reach your dreams? Or, or wh where, where, did, where was there a mindset shift as a kid? Like, how did, you, how did you get into this place where you knew you were capable of actually reaching your dreams? Or you had the desire to actually, because many people have dreams, most never go after them. Well, that's a loaded question right there. I failed a lot. And one of the lessons my grandfather taught me is he goes, you're going to try things and you're going to fail, but those failures will probably lead you into a bigger, bigger and better dream. And I never understood that for the longest time. And then I went through the minors. We never had a high school baseball team because my football coach hated it. You know, you're playing football, you're in Texas. That's what Texas is about. We play high school football. And we're the home of the $70 million high school stadium, which is absolutely ridiculous. But that's what it was. And he hated baseball, but I wanted to play baseball. Everywhere my father moved around the country, I played. And I'd take my ball and glove everywhere he moved. I'd show up. I never had to say a word. I'd show kids I could throw. I had a team full of friends. I never had to say anything. And I was perfect because I learned not to speak when I was a kid because my my father would look at me and go, children are to be seen and not heard. And I heard that every single day. And he was big and he was scary. And so I didn't talk. So to have my grandfather start to pull stuff out of me, it's a whole combination or equation of things that happened that set me up for success. And part of that success is failing. And, you know, with my father, I learned how not to do things. With my minor league career the first time, I learned that doctors may know more than me. And, you know, they would say, take six months off before you pick up a ball. And I would take six weeks off and start throwing again. And just naive and immature and not ready, out of the game, went back to college, started teaching and coaching. I thought, if I can't play the game I love, maybe I can teach it. And loved it. Loved working with kids. My kids in science classes excelled. My high school teams excelled in baseball. But you asked me, how did you set yourself up for success? It was actually a group of high school kids in West Texas who pushed me back into my dream when I thought it was over. And one of the first things that happened to me was at 28, I had a surgery in which the doctor said, you will never, ever pitch again physically impossible. I cut 85% of your deltoid out. It can't happen. You can't throw. And so that was my mindset. Well, I'll teach then. And so I started teaching the game and it was through that group of kids. When I pushed them to be better, they pushed me and we made each other better. And I think that's what the teamwork is, whether it's a family model, whether you're, it's a church model, whatever sport you do, whatever work environment you're in, I don't ask my kids to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. If I'm not willing to get dirty, why should I expect them to get dirty? And so I think it was the teaching from zero to 15 with my father of never being good enough to telling kids, you can do anything you want to. You just got to believe. What, what happened those in that, yeah, with, those, with those kids? What actually happened? So you, what propelled <laughs> you? It's, it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah. Well, in 1999, where the story takes place, this group of kids, I'm on my way to baseball practice one day, I stop off at the field house. And the athletic director, head football coach, pulls me aside and tells me, you've taken these kids as far as you can. 
He's not the person who hired me a year and a half before. He came in after. These kids are losers. Their parents are losers. They're never going to amount to anything. They're never going to go to college. They're stuck here. They don't know how to get out. And then he put his finger in my chest and he goes, and you might be one of the best baseball coaches I've ever seen, but you're going to come in last to me every time because I know how to step on people. You're too nice. And all I can think was, and they put you in charge of everybody. That's, that's awesome. Two of my kids are around the corner and they heard it. And before I could get to the field, they had told all the other kids. And so where the movie starts off, we lose the first two games, we get run ruled 15 to one and 15 to zero. And then you got to rely on your experience. I sent the kids down the left field line. I stood on home plate and I just said a prayer. And the gist of it was, what can I do to help these kids? How can I teach them? How can I push them without breaking them? How can I get the best out of these kids that they don't even know they're giving yet? And so there is no ceiling for them so they can keep going onward and upward. And the answer was so simple. I thought, wow, which I never would have thought of. Go down there and teach them what your grandparents taught you. And that's when I walked down the left field line, started talking about hopes and dreams and goals. I said, you guys have to go out and live life. You can't let life live. You don't let anybody dictate to you what you're going to do with yours. Anybody. Get 20 minutes in, the kids are paying attention. They're smiling. They're engaged. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Ernest will be proud. And that's when my catcher, my senior on the team, he goes, what about you, coach? I said, what about me? He goes, what about your dreams? I said, my dream is to watch you guys be successful in the classroom and on the field, graduate from high school, go to college, see what's out there. He goes, no, no, no. We know that and we love you, but we think you still want to play baseball. And I said, uh, no, sir, I want to stay married. Thank you very much. I've had nine surgeries. I weigh 260 pounds. Your moms make fresh homemade tortillas for me every time I get on a bus. That is not a player's diet. That's a coaching or a, a scouting diet. And but coach, the way you teach us the game, we know your heart's still in it. Mm -hmm. We know what the other team is going to do before they do it. When you throw us batting practice, we can't hit it. And I said, that's because you can't hit. And then they started giggling. They said, well, why are you telling us to chase our dream if you're not willing to do it yourself? And you have to understand the rapport I had with these kids. I had been yelled at, screamed at, and cursed at by my father, by my mother, by coaches, and my upbringing. I knew that is not the way to communicate. My way to communicate is by talking to, not talking at. And so we had this deal where we could joke with each other. I'm not going to get on the kids for that because I do it. And I looked at my catcher. I said, shut up. You're 18. And, and they started getting on the end. They go, why are you trotting? And I said, I can't do that. <clears throat> what it came down to is if we win a district championship coach, which we've never been a part of, you try out again. And I made the bet knowing, number one, they probably wouldn't win. And number two, if they won, I could embarrass myself if it would help pull these kids out of everything they've been conditioned to believe in the negative. If that'll help them believe it positively, yeah, I'm in it. I'm in. Let's go. I'll do it. Two things I thought, man, you're going to be divorced. And this is going to be so embarrassing. You're not going to be able to live it down, man. It's going to be funny. Mm -hmm. Big, old, fat, white guy out there trying to pitch. They win. They win a district championship. They hold up the trophy. And I think at 35 years of age, watching that group of kids celebrate something that not even they thought they could do, I finally understood everything my grandparents were teaching me it's not about me it's about we and what can we do as a team no matter what your team or who your team is the people on your team need to be the very best so you can be your very best and when I pushed them they pushed back I finally understood at 35 sometimes men take a little longer to come around to that because we're a little slow on the uptake but mm -hmm. I got it and after we get knocked out of the playoffs, school's already over, we're out of the playoffs. I find a tryout, it's in my hometown of Brownwood. Howard Payne University, Tampa Bay Devil Rays, Doug Gassaway's a scout, he's about 70. And when he looks up at me, I had my three kids there, eight, four, and one. <laughs> he goes, how many kids you bring to the tryout? And I pointed at my kids and he goes, no, two tryout. And I said, well, I brought me. And he said, oh, people are here for serious business. They want to be ball players. Why are you here? 
And I explained to him that for my kids to believe in me that I needed to step out and do something that nobody thought I would do. So here I am. And if you don't let me throw, I'm going to find somewhere else because I made a promise and I'm living up to my promise because my word is who I am. And when I got done, this is back when I had hair, so don't judge. He goes, why didn't you just shave your head like every other coach? And I said, where were you three months ago, man? I'm going to let you throw, but you're going to throw last. These guys are here for serious business. They have to throw from the outfield. They have to hit. They have to run. Do you want to run? I said, I do not run. And he giggled at me, and I waited four hours. Kids and I had a picnic, played games. I changed diapers on my one-year-old. And when he calls me out the mound, he tosses me a ball, and he goes, how many pitches do you need to warm up? I said, to embarrass myself, none. I just want to pitch quickly, run off the field, hopefully remembering to grab my kids on the way to my car. He giggled at me again. He walks back behind the backstop. And all through this process, when through one through my mind is God has a great sense of humor. I'm in a place I shouldn't be. I'm trying to play baseball when I should be getting out of baseball. I've already been told you can't pitch, it's impossible. And yet here I am because of a group of kids. Throw the first pitch, strike. I admire it. I look over the catcher's head and Gasaway is shaking the radar gun. I'm like, I do not even throw hard enough to register. That is more embarrassing than I thought. All the young kids threw like 20 pitches. When I get up to 60, I think they're making fun of the fat old guy and that's me. And he finally looks at this kid and they've all put their equipment back in the car but they've kind of congregated around home plate. And in my mind, I'm going, you're either doing really good or really bad. Tells this kid to get his bat and get in the box. And this kid turns around and he goes, you want me to get in there against that? And I think for the first time that hit me, I was like, wow, maybe I'm not doing too bad. I get done. I get my kids in the car. It's Texas. It's about 9,000 degrees in the summer. Turn the air on. Gasaway meets me in the car. He goes, I remember you. 15 years ago at Ranger Junior College, you were a football star. Everybody wanted to make a picture out of it. I said, yes, sir. He said, Jimmy, back then you were tall and thin. You threw like 87 or 80. I said, yes, sir. He goes, well, son, I don't know you've done your time off aside from eat. But the first pitch you threw without warming up was 94. Everything after that went up to 98. Wow. I'm stunned. The first thing that goes on, anybody on the planet, somebody comes up to you and goes, you're throwing 98. There is a happy dance going on between your ears. You're like, I throw gas. The second thing I thought was, you have been throwing 98 miles an hour at high school, kids. You're getting sued is what you're getting. And it, just a funny thing for a teacher. I'm like, I have, cannot believe I've been throwing almost 100 at high school kids for three months. So three months after the bet, I'm at a tryout. Three months after the tryout, I'm in the big leagues. Not because I thought I could do it, because a group of kids pushed me back into it. God talks to us wow. in all kinds of ways. We just have to be willing to receive what he's saying. He used a group of kids to get me back out there, chase my dream again. And at 19, if I would have got that dream, I would have been probably a selfish, immature brat, and I wouldn't have cared. But at 35, uh, having worked so many jobs and gone back to school and had kids and raised kids, I didn't take the game for granted anymore. And I first one there, last one to leave and enjoyed getting a second chance at being a kid again. And it was a blast. And I have those kids to thank for that. That's a, that's a powerful story. Uh, not only of actually going after your dreams, but uh, of really having a, people that hold you to a higher standard that you surround yourself with. That's kind of the nugget that yeah. I took away from that is who, uh, who is around us for, for those of you guys that are listening, right? Who is around you that is holding you to a higher standard that sees you bigger than you see yourself, that knows that you're capable of so much more, right? Like those kids did with you, Jim, was they, they knew that they, they believed in you and knew that you could do something bigger than even you believed in yourself. And that, I mean, that holds so much weight and so much power. It's, 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 it's almost not even quantifiable. Like you can't even, you can't even, you can't break that. There's, you, you can't even imagine the power that actually comes from that. But in something like that, taking a guy that's a high school coach to going to being in, in, you know, a professional athlete within a few months is out of control, like uh, just incredible. So 
I'm questioning, right? Just even even me now, who who is around me that's holding me to a whole nother level that sees, you know, a life that I don't even see inside myself. And so I think there's power in that. The associations are such a critical piece, I feel like, of of successful people. Uh, from the people that I've met, they they just are really particular and really aware of the associations. Sometimes they get lucky, you know, and they get some good people around them. And other times the they're intentional with the people um yeah that are holding them to a higher standard so that's a that's a powerful story um what uh so so now that you've been on this journey you've been you've been speaking uh they made a movie about about that and you've been on this journey of inspiring other people um what do you feel how, how does it how does it make you feel when you see people that are living lives of mediocrity and, and, and lives where they're just not excited and they have no passion and they're living at a job or working at a job that they're, there's no fulfillment from or a business that there's no fulfillment from. What advice would you give to those, to those people that are just living in that constant space sometimes till the day they die? Um, yeah. Go back to the drawing board, figure out why you're toiling so hard to achieve so little and but number one and most important, you have to expect, expect more out of yourself. And if you can't get it out of you, then you need to surround yourself with people you can get it out of. And we can live up to or down to expectations put upon us. But if you surround yourself with the best, they're going to want the best. And they're going to lift you up. And you're going to achieve things you never thought possible. But if you're with people who want to drag you down, people are willing to do that also. And so... For me, that whole journey taught me and reaffirmed everything that my grandparents taught me. Put your time in, work hard, but always give back and find a way to stay humble through all of it. Because nothing is about you. It's about what God does through you. And mm -hmm. go back to my grandparents for a second. Back in the set, late 70s, early 80s, when I lived with my grandparents, back when the church was about four walls in religion, my grandparents already were teaching about faith and grace at a time when that wasn't really popular. But it wasn't that they were talking about it, they were doing it, they were living it. And I looked at them and there was a smile on their face every day. And my grandmother was our church secretary for 30 years. My grandfather owned the menswear store and he was either at work at the store or he was at church helping her. And she was either at church doing her job or she was at the store doing accounting for my grandfather. So basically they worked seven days a week. I never saw them down one day. They smiled every day, even when it was really tough and my grandfather developed ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. The man who led so many people on his shoulders when he was healthy was now leading people on his shoulders from a wheelchair. He was an example to look up to. And when you surround yourself with the best, you want to be the best. That's, uh, that's, that's, that what's resonating with me is, is the way, cause you, you got so, you had so much inspiration from your grandparents to the point that you now are inspiring tens, hundreds, if not millions based off that movie, right? You've inspired, you're inspiring a, tr a tremendous amount of people based on you just living with somebody and seeing how somebody operated. That inspires you to that level. And it, it resonates with me, like, how am I living? Am I living a life that is inspirational to my kids? Are my kids gonna turn 18 or turn 30, when they turn 35, are they gonna go, and say and look back at the life lessons that they learned from me and say i need to live my best life like i need to go out and inspire other people like are they going to look at that or are they going to say hey my dad was a good dad he was a good dad he was a good guy he loved me or is it going to be so impactful that that they now look back and they their lives are completely changed and they're making an impact maybe even greater than the impact that that i had and so i um I love that. I love that because it's we, we get one chance to do this. And so if we're not living out our dreams and going all out, then we uh, we're miss we're really missing the mark of, of, of the amount of impact we can have on not only not only our kids,
but the people that are around us, our employees, um, our team members, I mean, just, just everybody that's around us. So, yeah, I, um, so uh, you, you talked about grace and I haven't had this conversation in, in a while on a, on a podcast, but how does grace show up in, in your life? Like, so you seem like you, you, you have, you hold a pretty strong, uh, humble presence. Uh, there's a, there's a, a humility about you. I could tell when I first, when I first met you, uh, which is powerful because there's a lot of people that almost try to act humble, but they're really not humble. So you just hold a genuine, just humble, hum, a humble presence. Um, and so I think that combined, that also plays in the grace. That's a big part of grace because when we know that we're broken or we have our own issues or we've messed up, then it allows us, I feel like, to be more gracious to other people. But if we feel like our lives are are really on point, then we have a little bit maybe less grace. So how does grace show up? Do you consider yourself a gracious person? Do you show grace? And how, how, how do you show grace in, in, in your life? I, I will give people second chances that maybe they didn't think were coming. If somebody's expecting it, I probably don't give it. Yeah. But for me, grace is knowing how I felt when I never did anything right. And sometimes people just need a compliment or they need a kind word or they need a godly word to help them out of whatever they're in to get them moving again. And, you know, my grandfather talked about it a lot. He goes, if we're not failing, we're not trying. Mm -hmm. He goes, we're going to fail at something every single day. He goes, I can't be anybody else but me mm -hmm. and who God intends me to be. And my job is to pray about who God wants me to be and go out and try to be the best me I can be through God's eyes. And if I'm doing that, then I'm gracious. What about, uh, so that, that, that comment, if we're not failing, we're not trying. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a, that's a, that's a great, that's a great concept. And I've, I've taken that to heart. Uh, I had a, I have a, a reasonably successful water and fire restoration company. So about 45 employees and we're scaling it. Uh, but it got to a place of comfort where it was kind of operating on its own. And I, and I got to this place of, uh, complacency and I realized I, I'm, I'm not performing. I'm not my best. So when I'm comfortable and I'm complacent, I'm not operating at my best. And I can tell I get kind of lazy. I'll watch some TV shows. I'll kind of just get like, I'll start floating around. And it's and what I, what I am. And from previous experience, what I know is when I'm on the edge, you know, when I'm like taking big risks and I'm pushing myself and I'm like on the edge of what I'm capable of, like I bring a whole nother fire, uh, a fire that's that I just bring a different side of myself. And so, Two years ago, before I launched Rise Up Kings, I, I was sitting on the couch. I just felt called to do something bigger and something greater than myself. And it was scary uh, launching this thing because I had this big vision for what it could look like. And it, it was uh, extremely uncomfortable, but I decided, hey, you know what? Like, I need to be, I need to see what I'm capable of. I want to go impact people. So I'm going to go take this big risk. I gave myself uh, it was a, a little under two months to launch a full on three day. Navy SEAL status, like type event, a, a whole three day, and I've never ran a full three day event in my life. And I put on this three day event, all the marketing, the gear, the shirts, the backpacks, the facilitators, the coaches, like God pulled it all together. And I ran this event with 11 people uh, two months later after deciding to go launch it. And it turned out that was the start of this incredible movement that's now happening to supporting men to be better husbands and, and fathers and businessmen. But it was me taking a step and saying, hey, I'm gonna go do something that's so scary, that is a risk. And if I were to fail, it would be a legitimate like big fail. Like it would be embarrassing and it would cost a lot of money and it would be a big fail. But that's, that's the way I wanna live my life. I wanna live playing big instead of playing small. Because I, even though I had a relatively, right, call it a, a medium-sized company, that's not playing big. I, I, I was comfortable in that space. I needed to get outside of my comfort zone to go do something that would really push and propel me and be, and, and, and so that's kind of my, I don't know, I, I, I love that, that, that idea. If you're not, if we're not failing, like if you're not failing you're, or falling, you're not actually trying, like you're not even close to reaching your potential.
if you're not experiencing failure. Um, how, what's uh, what's next on your on your level of failure? Uh, is there anything that you're working on that's that's kind of big where it's uncomfortable and you don't know how it's going to turn out, or or have you planned that out yet? Right now, I'll tell you. I'll be honest with you. I am in the happy throes of being a grandparent. Mm. I've got a two-year-old granddaughter and I am enjoying her. And to see her processing what goes on behind those eyes, every movement that occurs in front of her is awesome because she's getting to start and she's going to look out and see the world and she is not afraid. Mm. And I see a child who's going to go far because she's not afraid. And, you know, to get back to the other thing, it's not always what we say, it's what we do. If I say one thing and I do something else, I'm not living by my standards. My kids will see that. My high school kids would see it. And people I work with will see it. I can say whatever I want to, and go, we're going to go do this. And, but if my actions aren't following that, I need to be willing to get dirty and stay dirty and go, I'm in it, man. God has this plan for us. And our tricky job is to try to figure it out. And our job is we'll never figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we just do the very best we can and keep pushing ourselves. He doesn't want people who are going to sit back and be quiet. He wants people who are going to get out and live. Because that's going to attract other people who want to get out and live. And, and not being afraid to fail. I'm in. So I don't know what my next <laughs> big dream I'm is. I'm challenging you because I know you've created a yeah. great life. of, uh, and, and you're in a different phase too. I get it. Everybody, we go through these cycles, right? These cycles of life. And you're kind of in this special phase. We're able to connect with... Uh, yeah, with with new little human beings. And so it's a, it's a different journey. But however, I'm still going to challenge you. It's deep within your soul that like risk. And I talked to a guy, he does, um, he does uh, extreme, like he climbed Mount Everest and uh, ended, ended up um, uh, losing his eyesight on the way down the uh, the mountain. Uh, he was up there for a period of time and anyway something something went wrong oh his, his lenses were not working correctly and so the light blinded him off of from the snow and so he literally went blind and had to make his way down into to summit mount everest down uh without any vision and so it's uh but he's he came back from that and he's still like hey i need to I need to continue this journey of kind of staying on the edge so anyway i would challenge you to uh you have that heart and soul i feel like that's a part of you to to take some risk right there's, there's something else that and I know you're making an impact, but I love challenging people at the same time, even guys that are high performers and uh, making a difference and changing lives. There's always there's always some uh, something we can do to get a little uncomfortable and to get a little, uh, you know, risky. So. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And so a couple, couple more questions I wanted to make sure I, I, I asked you, because it um, is a. Uh, you, you said you've said dreams don't end. What what, is, what does that look like? So, and so my dream, my vision for my life is is to uh, or the, is to awaken a generation of men who lead themselves, their families, and their businesses at the highest level to glorify God. So that's my vision I have for my life. And so my dream is I see my dream just speaking to tens of thousands of people and uh, coming from a place of authority because I'm living what I'm speaking. And I'm, and, and I'm just making a difference. I'm making an impact on these men and helping them. I'm holding them to a higher standard and I'm seeing them higher than they see themselves and causing them to really show up and live, live lives that glorify God. So when they, when people look at them and they say, Hey, that, that guy's different. Like the way he takes care of his wife, the way he takes care of his kids, like his, his, the way he should, takes care of his employees, like the way he's showing up. I want that. So that's my mission is to create more guys that, that aren't struggling with porn as much or, or aren't struggling, you know, aren't getting divorced from their wives that aren't filing for bankruptcy because they mismanaged some of their money or weren't paying attention to details. So guys that are really operating at a higher level. So that's my vision of my dream. Um, and sometimes I feel like we can get off track from that dream. But what, what, what does that mean? You dreams don't end. Um, so my I have my dream of my my future. What do you what do you? My dream 
I have to best choose what I think God is pushing me towards. And I've had certain people come into my life of late who have pushed me to think outside the box even more than I already do. And right now we're working on something I think can be pretty big. And basically we're going to do a little bit of what you're doing, but I want men to be men again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're going to be good husbands and we're going to be good fathers and we're going to be people who shut up when we need to shut up and who speak when we need to speak because we're letting our emotions, we're all wearing them on our sleeves and we're all angry and we're all mad and we're just going to tell everybody how we feel. Shut up and go achieve something. Don't sit there complaining about something you can't change. And go out and change something. And so we're working on that. Actually just had a phone call this morning about another partner who wants to be involved. And I think it's really cool because this thought process started with me at the beginning of last year before everything that's gone on. And one of the things I've always played with whoever was on my team, they've always been my friends. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what language they speak. If we're on the team, then it's we, it's not me. And it's not me against you because it's us against them. So let's go out and achieve something. And so all my friends have always been every color of everything. And I can tell you this, color doesn't matter when you have a chronic illness and, and color doesn't matter when you have an addiction. What matters is how we treat each other. And you know that goes back to my grandfather. There are good people and there are bad people. And that's just how it is. There was never a color with him. My grandfather was the president of the school board back in 1955, who started the desegregation in Brownwood, Texas. And it was bad back then. He went out on a limb and he said, we're doing this because I believe in it. We need, going back to the beginning of the talk, we need to lift people up mm -hmm. and quit tearing everybody down. Yep. And if we can build people up, then we can make our dreams a little bit higher and farther than we think we can go. But if we just sit here and complain, we're spinning our wheels and we're no, never going to get anything done. Yeah, I think social media has created that platform for complaining. You know what I mean? It's really created. It's almost uh, it's it's almost it's it's facilitating the complaining process. And it's 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 encouraging people to share your opinions to to really uh, in a way complain. And so I think it's created, there's the, the pros and cons of social media, right? There's so many, there's some major pros and some massive cons. And right now it's yeah. created a whole lot of um, negativity and creators and, and a lot of divisiveness in our country at the moment. And so um, there needs to be, uh, there's an uprising, I feel like of people that are wanting to take a stand, take action, make a difference on all sides. And so being involved, it sounds like you really want to be involved in that and, and working with men specifically. Is that kind of your vision working with guys or to, to... You kind, of, kind of do the whole gamut? Yeah. You know, we have the ladies involved too. And so, and there are some processes where we want the ladies talking to the men and we want the men talking to the ladies because we need to raise our expectations of what, how we should be treated. And that is everybody, how everybody should be treated. And if we treat people with grace and we lift them up, it's going to be a lot better than just tearing people down and say, I don't need those people because they don't count. Everybody counts. And Jesus walked around on the earth and people didn't believe him and he was there. Mm -hmm. And now he's not here right now in person. And that belief is just getting less and less. And it's up to you and me and other like minds to go, you can live in this world or you can be of this world. Which group are you in? Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. And my job is to get people who are just living here, who are expecting something else bigger and better when they taste their, take their last breath here and their first breath in heaven. And that's really what I want. So anything up that alley is something I'm going to be trying to achieve 
And so we've got some really strong minded people who are involved with this, who I think are gonna, gonna be incredible. I'd love to call you back at some point when we get it going because I think some of the names you'll be surprised with. And I think when you live the right way and you keep pushing yourself to do right and people see, even though sometimes we fail, mm -hmm. we're trying to do it right and we're achieving to do it right. And we're trying to even exceed those expectations. They want to be a part of that. They want to be a part of doing something good. On the flip side of that, when you see people complaining, then that's an opportunity to get all your gripes off your chest. And then you start sliding down that hill. And before you know it, it gains momentum. And there's a reason why we look up when we need help and not look down. Mm -hmm. God is a, uh, he's, he's, Christ is there uh, to support us, man. It's all his at the end of the day, right? Our purpose being in alignment with his purpose. And um, it's, it's, it's not, all, yeah. It's not our job to judge. It's our job to love. Yep. yep. And meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So kind of closing out, Jim, what would you say? So we have something called the four pillars, faith, family, fitness, and finance, which is business. How do you, um, how do, how does your faith, how does your faith play out in those different, in those different pillars? Like how, how important is your faith to those? And cause some people, right. And, and, and a lot of people are putting a lot of emphasis right now on business and hustle. Like the, the big thing is hustle, right? 12 hours a day, you know, do whatever it takes to create success and wealth. Um, but a lot of times the family and the faith pillars are getting left out. So how do you actually, I'm going to rephrase that question. How do you, how are you investing in your faith pillar? Like, how do you invest in, in Christ? Like, what are you doing to stay grounded? No, I read my Bible every day and I find out other people are going through today, but we, they went through back then. Yes. It's just a little bit different environment. Faith plays out in my life every day and I get up and work out every day. And I do Bible studies every day. And we're working on a Bible study now. The more you stay in the word, the more you're going to live by the word. And that's just how it is. Uh, for me, the last 20 years have included 70 surgeries and Parkinson's and everything else. And so fitness for me is also important. Wow. Eating well is important. Yeah. And, you know, God likes to show off. Um, three years ago, I was healed of Parkinson's. And people don't like to hear that because they're like, well, how did you do it? That, that's amazing because I, I I rarely ever hear that actually. So you you were wow, that's incredible. So you were healed from Parkinson's. Um, was it was it more of an instant thing? Was it kind of a they take a little like how how that how that look? That's really that's. that's <laughs> it was a for the most part it was gradual until one night, yeah. and then one night kind of everything changed. I didn't know it was going to change yet, but 12 hours later, it, it changed. And the deep brain stimulator that I had with the battery in my chest, which TSA loves when you travel to check out the battery because you got to see if it's going to explode. And you're know, like, I don't want to blow up. So the battery's for my brain. I had that taken out last June. So the one surgery I had that was my own choosing was to have it taken out last June. And my neurosurgeon made me wait for two years before he took it out just to make sure that I was okay with that. And I did all the tests and I did all the dopamine scans. I drink the nuclear stuff and then I do the MRI. We don't understand it, but your dopamine levels are fine. You're healthy. We don't know what happened. It's God. And I think when you're faithful and here's my big deal, people go, how have you heard his voice so often in your life? He talks to us all the time. Are you listening to that voice or not? I've listened. When I went back to baseball, let's go back to the movie. There were three different times in AAA I wanted to quit because I needed to go home and make money for my family. Not make any money in the minor leagues. Three different times I sat in my hotel room going, God, if this is what you want, I'm really hard headed. You got to show me. And three different occasions, one, I got a glove contract sent the money home to pay bills. I stayed and played. The next month there was a shoe contract. Money goes home, 
to pay bills and I stay. The next one was I got called up. And we don't know what can happen until we're willing to take that chance to see what will happen. Because if we just halfway do things, we're gonna get a halfway answer. I want it all. And so I'm willing to put in the effort. In 2001, I walked away from the game because in five days I went from Chavez Ravine working out with the Dodgers and doing everything 100% running, throwing, hitting to Vero Beach where they still had spring training and I couldn't judge a ball being thrown back at me in five days. And I couldn't bunt. I teach bunting. How can you not bunt? How can you not catch a ball with a bat? I was scared to death. If I throw the ball up there 100 and they hit it back at me 120 like Stanton does, I can't get out of the way. It's going to hit me in the mouth. And so I quit. I blamed it on my arm, but I was scared. I went home. We did the movie over the next 20 years, 70 surgeries, mostly nerve related. And then the Parkinson's thing three, four years ago, my mother bought me a cane to walk around the block. And now I'm running five to seven miles a day mm. and I'm lifting and people go, you're not, what were some of the comments? How dare you? say that you were healed of Parkinson's. Obviously you didn't have it. Honey, I've got all the tests and all the money I spent on all the procedures I had to have over the last 15 years. You didn't see us crying every night when we didn't have an answer. We're just trying to get through the next day. You didn't see us through 70 surgeries. You didn't see us when my stomach quit working because of the medicine for Parkinson's worked but it killed my stomach. And so I had to have gastric bypass. And that's when we got the deep brain stimulator. If you weren't around to see me go through any of that, then don't tell me what I went through. And God can do anything. Why do we put limits on him? Yeah, we, um, I do that regularly. <laughs> Not purposely, right? I put, I put limits. I put limits on, on what I think or, or, or maybe even why I think you'd want to do something. Um, yeah, well, here's one of my examples. Well, you helped me get back to baseball and the medical community said I couldn't do it. And now you healed Parkinson's and everybody says that's impossible. Why not this? I want that. Why can't I have that? That's not what God wants for us. <laughs> Sometimes the answer is no, and it needs to be no. Yeah. You have a, uh, your, 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 yeah, the amount of, of um, surgeries, your life story um, is, uh, it's, it's all on purpose, right? God, God did it all on, ha allowed that stuff all to happen on purpose, I believe, so that you could make a difference and inspire other people to go live their life with no excuses. You know, if somebody hurt their leg, you know, they're not going to do a workout or somebody's not feeling good, right? So it's like seeing what you've gone through and hearing what you've gone through. There really is no excuses to go after your dreams and go reach to 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 the stars, to whatever is whatever is humanly possible while we're on this earth and in alignment with what we believe. And I love that in alignment with what we believe God or what we're hearing from God and taking the time to listen to God and say, hey, what do you want for my life? That's actually part of an experience we do at our uh, event is a chance to listen to God and be present and quiet so they can really hear. And people do hear from God. That's the crazy thing. But they don't slow down enough to actually listen and to be present and to get all that other crap out of our mind and to get those walls dropped down to where they can fully just be present with God. And so, um, so Jim, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate that inspirational story. I hope the people that are listening have taken some notes to either go spend time with God alone or to really get back to the drawing board and to get out of their comfort zone to go do something great, something amazing um, that they would be proud of and their kids would be proud of and God would be proud of. We're not, I don't believe we're built to be average. He did, we're not average human beings. Like. We're not made to settle. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. And we get in this life of settling. So um, we could go on. I can go on for, for hours, I'm sure, with you on this topic. But uh, um, Jim, thanks again for being on the show. How can people how can people get a get a hold of you? Uh, Jim, the rookie Morris dot com. Jim, the rookie Morris dot com. Yeah. OK. 
Fantastic. We're on social media too, so look us up. Jim Morris. Okay. Awesome, brother. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a great week. Thanks. Thank you.